I'll now turn the presentation over to Shannon Royce. Shannon. Thank you, Ben. I join Lisa in her praise of your managing the always present technical challenges that come with Zoom. So thank you so much for helping us with that. My name is Shannon Royce. I'm the director of the Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiatives here at the Department of Health and Human Services. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to the sixth and final webinar in our series, uh, Spirituality and Mental Health. Uh, we have been thrilled to do this series with Dr. Lisa Miller at the Spirituality Mind Body Institute at Columbia University. Um, we are so grateful for her presence with us today. And I just want to touch on a few housekeeping items, which if you've been with us before, you could probably do this. But for our newcomers, we want to share them again. So uh, this is an educational webinar off the record and not intended for press purposes. So if you're a member of the press, we would ask you to please allow us to connect you with ASPA after the program. If you're having trouble hearing, sometimes folks are not able to hear well through their computer audio. So if you're having trouble hearing, uh, we encourage you to call the phone number provided by Zoom at the bottom of your screen and that way uh, you can hear clearly through your own um, phone service. Uh, we will be sending a link to the program and any materials uh, shared by our speakers uh, in a follow-up email that will go out in the next day or two. And so we encourage you to watch for that. And finally, um, if you'll please uh, put your questions down in the Q&A feature. We do have a very busy program today. We actually have three speakers to introduce to you. And so it will be a very full program, but we do want to get to as many questions as we can. And so if you'll just put your questions down in the Q&A feature, we will get to as many of those as we can at the end of the program. And now Lisa, let me turn it over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you again for being with us. Shannon, thank you. Um, and I want to thank everyone on this Zoom. This is the concluding session of our webinar. We have had six very timely, very moving, very deep thinking webinars. And there is a felt sense that the 2,000 people to join us every other week have formed a community of connection and common purpose. One of our guests today, Reverend Dr. Walter Fluker, has a beautiful way of saying, can we assemble in deep common purpose without necessarily agreeing on everything? And to that I might add, without being identical twins. And I think our six webinars have been a beautiful statement of the possibility of renewal of civic society, of assembling, as Dr. Kluker would say, in common purpose. Shannon Royce, thank you for your leadership. Our partnership has been tremendously productive, tremendously impactful. The Spirituality Mind Body Institute, as those of you who've joined us know, is a primarily clinical science driven organization. We generate science and use science to seed a more spiritually supportive society, focusing primarily on mental health and human thriving. Into today's discussion, on renewal of common purpose, of common being in civil society, and our capacity to heal as community, I'll share just a couple notes of science. Um, if I might, then the next slide. We face a time with sharp increases in what we might call the disorders of alienation, depression, addiction. The connective tissue is very weak in our society, and yet hand in hand with this dive in wellness, this extraordinary increase in pathology, depression, addiction, anxiety, suicidality, hand in hand has been a sharp decrease in spiritual and religious life. And if you might show the next slide, the two indeed go hand in hand. Um, and if we were then to think of the cultural tidal wave that subsumes us, uh, next slide, thank you we would say that how did we get here? Well, perhaps in the very good intention, in the well-meaning desire to be inclusive, we threw religion out of the public square. And with that, threw the baby out with the bathwater. 
and we now have a generation of young adults who have not been immersed in the de facto spirituality that shaped our country for a very long time. Next slide. Um, spirituality and religion go hand in hand for many people. Two thirds of Americans would say so. About 30% of millennials say I'm spiritual, but not religious. And can we find our way back where, whether through pluralism, with a deep respect and interest in one another as we have lived out in these six webinars, or through universalism, as the science shows us a common seat of spiritual being and connection between us, find our way back to a deeper form of connection, a felt common place of being. Again, not as identical twins, not always as a green, but in assembling in common being and purpose. And here I'd like to show you very briefly, and if we might skip a slide, all the way up, uh, thank you, all the way up, um, since I wanna be brief, just to the brain slides, this. This is the spiritually connected brain. Um, regions of strong perception, cortical thickness in the precuneus, occipital, parietal, regions of reflection and orientation, a sense of who we are, and what we're doing here on earth through the spiritually aware brain. And if we might go up just a couple more slides, we see that using this form of perception, next slide, thanks, we are able to look at times of trouble and darkness and find light, find trauma, disorientation, to be a gateway to a deepening of spiritual life. This is a choice right before us that we all have, to use our brain in any moment to see into common being and connection, spiritually aware brain, or to look only narrowly in terms of competition, splinteredness, othering, othering as Tim Shriver often says, othering of one another. This is our choice. Um, we published this in uh, Oxford University Press, Cerebral Cortex. This is a brain um, engaged in spiritual awareness by choice, by choice of how we tell the narrative. Next story. Um, Next slide, thank you. We can see, feel, and know a common sense of connection. Um, this is our birthright. And so when we think about coming together in aggregate, we're thinking about a form of relational spirituality. And here's where I am so very honored that we are joined by three leaders who have led community into a deeper felt sense of relational spirituality, a common place of being. Next slide, thank you. Um, there's a larger sense of who we are. And um, I invite uh, all of you to follow up with us. Final slide at the Spirituality Mind Body Institute. Um, we don't have much choice at this moment, but to find common ground to move forward and to heal and to renew. Um, and so thank you for doing that here and now over these six webinars. Thank you for your collaboration, Shannon and Ben, the Partnership Center. Um, thank you to our 2,000 colleagues for your contributions to renewal, and I look forward to today's final webinar. Thank you so much, Lisa. We appreciate the partnership we've had with you, and I too look forward to the presentations today. We're going to start today with Rabbi Shaul Praver, and I'm not sure I said your first name right. Forgive me if I didn't, you can clarify for me. Rabbi Praver was a former congressional rabbi in Newt Newtown, Connecticut, who served as a first responder at the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School on December 14th, 2012. I think we all remember that uh, day very well. Newsweek recognized him as one of the 50 most influential rabbis in America that year. His voice was and continues to be a voice of hope and resilience. Rabbi Praver was ordained by the Jerusalem Rabbinette in 1989, earned his Doctor of Ministry from Hartford Seminary in 2019, and was recently appointed Senior Fellow at the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute in Washington, DC. He's a clinically trained chaplain and spiritual care provider with Norwalk Hospital and works for the Connecticut Department of Correction at facilities in Chester and Newtown. Rabbi Praver recently published a book and has several other manuscripts following, including his account of the Newtown shooting, detailing what happened, why it happened, 
and how we can stop it from happening again. Rabbi, thank you for being with us. We're honored by your presence and we look forward to your presentation. Rabbi Prabhupada, you're on mute, so just make sure to come off mute, please. Thank you, Shannon. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, Dr. Miller, thank you for your introduction that put us into a good uh, atmosphere and spirit to, uh, for me to share. Uh, really, the, the gems, the most essential things that I uh, garnered from my experiences. I was in Newtown as the uh, community rabbi. I was in my 12th year at the time of the shooting. Um, I was called down to the firehouse. I wasn't sure why or exactly the magnitude, uh, but eventually I uh, figured it out. Um, my coping mechanism was denial. And uh, those of you that uh, are in this field, so many of us out there um, know that a human being uh, confronted with such a disturbing trauma of 20 children being killed in their first grade classroom, um, you never know how you're going to cope or how you're going to react to that. My uh, method was um, denying until I couldn't deny it anymore. But then I had to be the rabbi and I had to be the chaplain, so I had to hold it together. I had to be there for other people. And so there I was, I, I walked into the firehouse and there was a long table of all women. And at the uh, head of the table was a congregant, congregant of mine who was kind of the leader of these teachers. And she was speaking to them. They were very quiet, they were listening. Um, I didn't want to interrupt, but as I came into her view, she popped out of her seat and she uh, threw her arms around me and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, thank you so much for being here. Her voice was like a child. And um, she just kept repeating and looking me straight in the eyes. You have no idea, Rabbi, it was terrible, so terrible in a voice of a, a girl. And um, this is a woman who generally is rather shy, would give you more of kind of a, um, a peck or an air kiss. And here she is um, holding me tightly. Um, and I just held on to her and then she um, let go and she looked me in the eyes, returning to her normal woman's voice and said, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much. That was my introduction to the ministry of presence and that it, this was a word that was just a word to me before this. I since went on and became clinically trained and I have a broader understanding now of what it is that I had done just naturally that day in Sandy Hook. When something of such an enormous calamity, such an enormous tragedy happens, there's a lot of, that person experiencing it is in a completely different place than the rest of the world. And just to have a uh, presence to witness and to be there is very, very grounding. And it's not uh, really anything that you have to say, but um, you have to be um, completely present with, with your eyes, um, with your, uh, attention and to be able to uh, absorb as a shock absorber uh, this horrific experience and somebody familiar, someone known, someone willing to listen um, is a point of, uh, of sanity and um, holding on to a sense of strength and that is so, so needed at, the, at that time. Well, as I went through, there were different responses. Some people were very agitated. Some people were uh, really uh, very withdrawn. Um, I called it at the time I was administering spiritual morphine. And I, I believe that was right. I still believe that it was a right 
terminology that they, when a patient is uh, having a lot of pain, physical pain, they receive a painkiller. And it's all right to comfort people. And at a time like that, um, it's very urgent. It, you have to understand that a, uh, a person lives not only for physical reasons, but they can, they can die spiritually in a moment. They can be changed forever uh, without the uh, spiritual care and nourishment uh, that is needed at critical times. Um, so I'm referring to the faith conversation, the God conversation. Is there a God? Where is my son's soul? Will I see him again? Where did he go? Okay. Um, so when someone is in that place, uh, we have a declaration of faith called Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If you change one of the letters, it would be perhaps God is our God. And perhaps there could be another. <laughs> if you change one little letter from the first word and the last word, that's not what people need. They don't need a philo philosophical inquiry. They need something very solid. Um, you know, yes, you know, I personally believe in the eternity of the soul. I believe you will see your son again. Give yourself the permission to share. Normally, not in a crisis, we would uh, explore that a lot slower, but this is emergency care. This is spiritual morphine that is needed now. Um, and so you can introduce this subject um, in, in my view um, and see if this is comforting for the person. Um, and if it is, then I would suggest to have that God conversation. Um, normally when we're comfortable, it's not urgent, but when there is a urgency, uh, suddenly the whole perception of a person in the, in the, uh, the throes of trauma is completely different. They have a totally different lens in which they're seeing the world. And uh, so this care is, is very essential. Presence also is uh, recognizing a person. It, it reminds them that they really do exist. Um, and I use this in my uh, ministry in prisons. When there's a situation, when there's a fight, um, I'll immediately go and call a person uh, by their first name and, and look at them in, in the eyes and say, yeah, I saw that that wasn't very nice the way the, this officer spoke to you. I got you. I got you. Come on. Come with me. We'll take a, we'll take a walk and talk about it. It immediately diffuses the situation. When a person explodes in a correctional facility, it's because they don't feel seen for the soul and the person that they are. And just the smallest measure of recognition and presence uh, fixes the situation generally immediately. And I've seen this over and over again, just by looking at a person and saying their name. So, those are some of the, um, the points I wanted to share. Also, the idea of a new kind of interaction, a new faith that is coming off of the uh, pulpit and going down to the people, where the people are. Um, it's a different kind of a world today. It's a, there's the internet. Um, if somebody can cozy up on a Saturday or Sunday morning with a double latte in their left hand, and in their right hand, their iPhone, having access to some of the best speeches and guided meditations. Why would they go to the synagogue or the mosque or the church? Um, so therefore, uh, houses of worship have to offer the kind of um, spiritual services, spiritual care that cannot be given by an electronic device. An electronic device cannot come over to your house and ask you how you feel, um, um, what are you thinking, what are your thoughts, um, that simply cannot happen. So the rebuilding of religion in um, America will come about, in my view, uh, through the, a new kind of skill, um, of a pastoral skill, uh, discipleship once again, 
uh, walking with people in a natural setting and talking to them and mostly listening, mostly listening to them, using the clinical uh, technique of um, attention and compassion um, and never taking away the agency of the person uh, using their words, their thoughts, their priorities, their pace, and um, having that calm kind of pastoral conversation with people. That will be the new magnet that will bring people back into the houses of worship when the spiritual leaders are truly spiritual. And that word spiritual is an important word because that's what unites us. If we got together in a room and we each decided to share the most spiritual or uh, experience of our lives or one of the most exper uh, spiritual experiences, we would find a lot of unity. But if we came into the room and shared our doctrine, there would be some pushback and we wouldn't be so quite as drawn. We would have some problems. Um, so spirituality is that which unites us. And uh, we all have this kind of... Um, collective spiritual uh, experience as human beings, we might see it or experience it in different ways. So um, just maybe, I, I, I don't know exactly the time, but if you could show the um, picture, uh, Ben, of the um, interfaith, the picture of the, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in times of trauma, it is very important that the, the clergy of all faiths come together um, Noah Posner was my congregant. I named him as a, as a young boy, he and his twin sister. Um, he was the only um, Jewish person of the 20 uh, victims. Um, and we, have a, we had uh, a very strong interfaith uh, association going on before the shooting. And we even got closer afterwards. Mm -hmm. Our presence was uh, very important. Um, not only for uh, the town, but for each other mm -hmm. to be able to hold on and continue uh, keeping on. And I think I'm probably out of time. I haven't been watching it with a watch, but um, let me um, at least pause there. Thank you, Rabbi. I really appreciate your sharing with us that um, even just watching that from a distance, it felt like such an overwhelming experience. I can't imagine having actually been there but your presence there was obviously a real balm to the people um, who were walking through that trauma. And so I thank you for sharing that with us today. Thank uh, you. Questions at the end, I'm sure there will be questions for the rabbi, but we'll turn now to our next speaker, Dr. Jamie Ayton. Dr. Ayton is the founder and executive director of the Humanitarian Disaster Institute and Blanchard Chair of Humanitarian and Disaster, Relief, uh, Disaster Leadership excuse me, at Wheaton College. He's the author of a book on his personal journey with Katrina response and stage four cancer and how it taught him about faith and resilience. In 2016, he received the FEMA Community Preparedness Champion Award at the White House. Jamie, we're so pleased to have you with us today and uh, we look forward to your presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for having me. And I just wanna say thank you to Rabbi Praver for the great presentation and insights that you shared. Um, with my talk, what I'm gonna focus on is looking at some of the research actually behind some of the things that were just discussed, such as looking at the impact of presence and the overall important role that faith communities have to play in times of major crises, especially during COVID-19 and in general on our positive mental health. Our team actually published a research article not long ago in the Journal of Psychological Trauma with the American Psychological Association. And in that particular journal, we ended up reviewing every single research article that had been published over the last 44 years that looked on issues of both spirituality, religion, and mental health. And what we concluded after going through these decades worth of research was that we were able to say with confidence that religion and spirituality by and large, in general, has a positive effect and buffering impact on uh, mental health, that it can help us to be able to cope with difficult times, that the research also showed in terms of trends that our faith can help us to make sense and meaning out of a world like COVID-19 when everything seems to be turned upside down or disjointed. 
One of the other things that we found from that particular review was that a person's faith can also help them to be able to maintain hope and to maintain endurance for going through marathon types of chronic challenges. You know, in my case, I shared some in the book that it was both from going through Katrina, but also through personal health crises. So our faith is uniquely equipped to be able to help us to understand and navigate these sorts of issues. Another reason that we found that faith is so important on our mental health is that it can also help to draw us into community with others. And so I'll give a few examples here real quickly. Uh, one example of this would be after Hurricane Michael. One of the things that we found was that individuals that received what they saw as positive spiritual support ended up having much fewer negative mental health consequences in the aftermath of that disaster. Now, I really want to zone in here on something that's important, which is positive spiritual support. So maybe some of you grew up in a faith tradition where your congregation had a, a gossip chain, I, I mean a, a prayer chain, right? The, where we would engage and share, and hopefully it was a prayer chain and not a gossip chain. But the reason why I bring that up is that our faith and our faith communities can be both a positive resource or can actually heap on or compound the struggles that we may be going through. So for example, look back to the book of Job as an example there that we see that it actually wasn't until his friends that came to provide support for him opened their mouths that they compounded his struggles. But when they were there and just silent initially that they were there for him, but it wasn't until they said things that were blaming and uh, damaging towards him that it caused additional challenges. So we wanna make sure that our spiritual support uh, is actually helping and not hurting. Uh, another reason why faith communities we found are so important is that that positive spiritual support can be offered by not just somebody with a lot of expertise, but by a lay helper. That it really just having our neighbor love our neighbor can help to prevent uh, and lower levels of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And so specifically, I'm thinking about a study that we did after the mass shooting in Roseburg. So you may remember in Oregon, there was a community college and a mass shooting that took place. Well, we ended up doing some research shortly after that particular event. And again, what we found was that those individuals that reported receiving higher levels of positive spiritual support, that it drastically reduced PTSD. In fact, if I were to put up a slide, it would look a little bit like a roller coaster ride where you actually see that as the levels of positive spiritual support go up, that PTSD symptoms among those that we surveyed drastically went down. So just want to really echo what was shared in the last presentation about just how powerful of being in the suffering or setting in the suffering of others, how big of a difference that can make in their lives. And then I've also experienced this from a firsthand experience. After Hurricane Katrina, Many of the faith communities there referred to that weekend, especially some that uh, referred to that Sunday in particular, as Slab Sunday. And the reason for that was that many of the congregations still met, even though many of their buildings had been completely demolished. That their congregations and people for their community, maybe even people that had never been to their congregation before, showed up on that particular Sunday morning to come together and to worship and to cry and to hug one another and to support one another. That's a role that the faith community can play that no other organization can do. That we need collaborations across all different groups, whether it's with government, with its for, for profit, nonprofit organizations, but local faith communities have a unique role to play in the aftermath and amidst catastrophes, whether it's something like Hurricane Katrina or COVID-19, because they know their communities, they're trusted by their communities, and communities are going to seek out their help. I'll never forget after Hurricane Katrina doing another study where we were wanting to understand the role of the African American church and how they were responding to the mental health needs of their communities. And what we found was that even though uh, minority uh, patients were not seeking nearly um, as often mental health services as uh, Caucasians, for example, that many were turning to their church. And so we wanted to understand what, what were some ways that we could collaborate to bolster that collaboration and make an impact on underserved communities? And we were able to develop a, really a three-tier training model. You know, one of the things I think that sometimes mental health professionals, and by the way, I'm, I'm a psychologist, but I'm also a former youth minister and had been involved in campus ministry uh, prior to uh, going back to school as a psychologist. 
And so I kind of bring that unique lens. But one of the things that I've noticed is sometimes mental health professionals don't always recognize the huge resource that faith communities can be in times of national crises. You know, so one of the things I often ask when I'm working with mental health professionals is on a given week, how many clients could you see? You know, so maybe they say anywhere from 20 to 30 some or so clients. So that's about 30 hours or so of support that they could provide. But then if I were to ask the same question to faith leaders, then you hear from them that they've been not only meeting with that person um, in multiple services a week, but they've also checked in on them that there's small groups that that person's involved in, that that same person who would have gone to get mental health care is also taking part in all kinds of other relief services that they're providing. And so I really would hope that we would see mental health professionals and faith leaders coming together and collaborating. And to help facilitate that, we developed out of our Katrina experience what we refer to as the camp model, where it's looking at clergy and mental health and academics coming together to be able to provide a more holistic response to mental health needs. And we continue to do that now. For instance, at the Humanitarian Disaster Institute where I work at Wheaton College, to be able to partner to make a positive impact on COVID-19 mental health. And so I just want to end now with one final example uh, was that really made a major impact on me was that I live only about 20 minutes away from where the Aurora mass shooting happened at a factory uh, not long ago. And on the Saturday that followed, it was a e normal evening for me, but I ended up receiving a call from a local faith community who said, we're meeting together and our doors are bursting at the seams of people that have shown up to be able to come and mourn this tragic loss. And we're needing someone to come in and help us walk through the mental health challenges, that we weren't prepared for the level of trauma that we're seeing by those that have come to our, through our doors. And so I hopped in my car and I took off to the church and I didn't do anything special that evening. I just helped to be a presence, um, as well was mentioned earlier, encouraged others to be a presence for one another. But one of the things that I've found through the years is that sometimes, even though we want to help and to be that presence, that sometimes our concerns of how can we actually help without causing harm prevents us maybe from reaching out to others, including during the time of COVID-19. So we also ended up just releasing a, a new course on spiritual first aid that helps walk others through in concrete ways how to provide practical presence and humble helping. And on our website, spiritualfirstaidhub.com, you'll find tons of free resources, including manuals, uh, an ebook for helping children going through COVID-19 mental health issues, tip sheets, and many, many videos and other free resources. So just wanna end by saying thank you all for the opportunity to be a part of this conversation today. And I just wanna encourage each of you to remember not the research, that's not what I want you to take away, but instead to remember that you showing up, whether it's virtually or in person and other catastrophes and during COVID-19, by being there, your presence says more than any words that you could ever say. Thank you so much, Jamie. I really appreciate what you've shared with us and we will include uh, the resources you mentioned in the follow-up email that will go out in this next couple of days. So um, Jamie has been a support to our team over this year as we've walked through uh, the challenges of COVID and just reaching out uh, to many across the nation as we've dealt with those mental health challenges. So thank you again for joining us today. We want to now introduce a Dr. Walter Fluker who serves as Dean's Professor of Spirituality, Ethics and Leadership at Candler School of Theology at Emory University. He also serves as Professor Emeritus of Ethical Leadership formerly the Martin Luther King Jr. Chair and the editor of the Howard Thurman Papers Project. He was founding executive director of the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership Center and the Coca-Cola Professor of Leadership Studies at Morehouse College. Dr. Fluker is a featured consultant, speaker, lecturer, and workshop leader at foundations, businesses, corporations, colleges and universities, governmental and religious institutions, both nationally and internationally. He's married to Dr. Sharon Watson Fluker and is the father of four children and six grandchildren. Dr. Fluker, we're thrilled to have you with us today and we'll turn the presentation over to you. Thank you so much, Shannon. And uh, of course, I've already pulled up my slides, so I'm not seeing anyone. I'm hoping that everyone sees me. Uh, please let me know that's true. 
Reverend Fluker, we can see you, but we can't see your slides yet. Can you go ahead and share your slides right now on your screen? Yeah, that's what I thought I was doing, and I'll do it again. Here we go. Uh, as a way of getting started while I'm uh, sharing uh, with you, uh, I'm delighted to be here. And so many thanks for uh, the Partnership Center for making this opportunity available. Uh, I've been kind of thinking about the best way to go about doing this. And I'm afraid uh, that I'm having, let me, okay, I think I got it. I think I got, is that there? Is it there now? Is it there now? It's there, but your yes, slide isn't open yet. Double click on it. Reverend Fluker, if you could give me a second, let me get your slides up and you can just ask us to advance your slides. Just one second. Okay, great. How about now? It's up now. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to uh, very briefly uh, walk you through uh, the kind of work that I've been doing for the past 30 years. I'm primarily interested in spirituality as a way or ways of being in relationship with the other. Uh, I'm certainly interested and believe in the power of presence, as has been noted, and have my own personal experiences with uh, trauma. Uh, I'm a second generation immigrant from Mississippi. I share some history I now know with Shannon, but I grew up on the south side of Chicago and uh, for the sake of time, it's been a long story, but a short walk. About 30 years ago, I had the most um, um, powerful experience. I had a dream of uh, individuals from my past uh, who were uh, uh, gang leaders who uh, walked me back through my old hood. I was teaching at a very prestigious Northeastern University and in the middle of this moment, I was brought back to my place of trauma. Uh, to grow up in an environment that is troubled with violence because of systemic practices of race and class and other things that we know so much about in this country. Uh, it was one of the most enlightening moments of my entire experience the presence of Inky and Anola uh, visited me. So in some of the materials that will come to you later, uh, you'll have an opportunity to hear an audio regarding Inky and Anola. I'd like today to emphasize spirituality as a critical resource in creating and sustaining a sense of community in crisis. Uh, I'm very interested, if you'd move the slide, and the ways in which a new generation of uh, activists and freedom fighters are uh, still dealing with the very complex systemic issues of race and other things are beginning to uh, move through this moment. And I'm interested in ways in which spirituality allows those who are activists involved in issues of justice and peace uh, to become morally anchored. Thus, most of my research over the past 30 years has been related to spirituality, ethics, and leadership. I choose a very simple definition of spirituality as uh, ways of seeking or being in relationship with the other. Uh, the other who is believed to be worthy, uh, Rabbi and Jamie, of recognition, respect, and reverence, to be seen, 
and to uh, have the uh, genuine respect for one's inherent dignity and worth, and even to see perhaps uh, the face not only of oneself, but the face of God as the other in the other. I have a very good friend who um, is, a, is a practicing shaman who was uh, converted to Catholicism at an early age, but later returned to his own work and his own village and tribe in West Africa. He has a saying. He says, if you want to get home, then you must give the other a ride. The other is more than simply the other person, but the other can also be a higher transcendent face, which one must face in order to see one's own being, one's own self. Can you move that for me? I frame spirituality this way. Uh, I think of spirituality in respect to formal notions of spirituality that are normally related to established religions. I also think of spirituality as uh, self-actualized or self-defined by individuals or small groups that may or may not be associated with established religious institutions. And of course, there are philosophical, aesthetic, and ethical notions of spirituality that are more related to values and perceived goods. For instance, truth, beauty, justice, and so on. Next slide, please. My primary concern, however, is relational. Spirituality involves facing the other. I borrow that term from uh, a rabbi and Professor Emmanuel Levinas, who believed that spirituality, that is facing the other, is the very origin of civil society and the foundation of ethics. In fact, spirituality requires that we face not just the other, but ourselves. And in this story that I tell about Inky and Anola, it's one of the first times I first saw myself, how afraid I was, how damaged from so many traumatizing experiences in my past that I began to understand what my calling was. I've pastored both a uh, church, I've served as a university chaplain, I've taught in seminaries and universities around the country, but I can tell you the deepest calling has been since that experience to the youth of this nation, particularly the youth with whom I've worked in places like Morehouse College and of course at Boston University. One of the major practices in this uh, work that I do in ethical leadership with youth is helping others to remember, retell, and relive their stories. Uh, the role of memory related to retelling, which is reframing one story and reliving the story as mission, is at the heart of the work that I do in ethical leadership. Next slide, please. I also think that spirituality demands that leaders, and again, most of my work has been in the cultivation of leaders, especially emerging leaders, that spirituality itself is integrally related uh, to a sense of self that recognizes the interrelatedness of life or a sense of community. And I borrow a sense of community from uh, my mentor and most of the um, work of Howard Thurman, uh, who almost invented the term search for common ground. A sense of community refers to the larger extended social and ecological sphere made tangible by nature. That is our bodies and the material world are important and defined ultimately as the universe, the cosmos, but in its final essence, it is spirit. We can return to some of those conversations if you'd like. Next slide. Uh, I created an ethical leadership model which serves both as a kind of theoretical template 
for my work, but also as uh, a model for training. And uh, we've conducted training in this country, Europe, China, India, so many places using this model. Uh, when you receive the materials, I'd like for you to note that character, civility, and community are at the heart of this model and that character relates to the personal side, civility more the social, community has to do with spirit. But the model itself is interactive. Ben, are you able to touch the uh, interactive side so that others can see down at the bottom? Mm -hmm. That the model is interrelated and it has nine different virtues, values, and what we call virtuosities. I don't think that works for you. But this is the model that serves uh, as the basis for training. And I only had several slides of some training venues of which I've been a part, especially with young leaders uh, from various communities. Can you yeah. move to the next slide? We'll advance to the next slide. Thanks, Reverend Fluker. Yeah, it wasn't working on our side, but we'll make sure to get that to everyone who participated. Many other today. troubles of the righteous, Ben, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Uh, this is at Morehouse College, where I was very privileged to spend 13 years developing a leadership center where young African American males from around the country and indeed, uh, indeed around the globe uh, came to work with this idea of ethical leadership using this model as a basis, but using narrative based net ethics, which emphasizes the power of story and memory and ways in which tradition and experience uh, empower individuals and communities uh, to find home or a sense of community in respect to self, society, and spirit. Next slide. Uh, these different uh, ways of framing th this model uh, around storytelling, critical thinking, and what I love to call aesthetic triggers. That is, these things that trigger consciousness, that make mindfulness and awareness possible. Uh, beauty, sometimes storytelling, but sometimes dance, the use of the body. And to see, for instance, some of these young men and also women who were included uh, engaged in what we call these rituals that stimulate consciousness is a powerful thing to behold. One or two more slides and then I'll wrap up. Uh, here again, there were daily rituals, meditation in the morning, uh, always centering, finding one's self, one's sense of self, purpose, home, Tai Chi, the use of the talking stick when one wanted to show recognition and respect and reverence for the other, one would gather in the center of a circle and speak truth from one's center. One of our great rituals, next please, was spiraling into the center. This is in Salzburg, Austria, where I have uh, students from Appalachia and African-American students from around the US gathered there and they are spiraling into the center. And in that center, they say from my center to the center of all things, I call myself. Let me just close this with this slide before you because there are others. Um, mainly, uh, the work that we produce uh, pays in great dividend going forward. I can now identify uh, major leaders in politics, in journalism, uh, in the academy, and people operating in several uh, countries around the world who were part of these programs at Morehouse College. So I wanted to share that with you, hoping that uh, even without my notes today, that the Baptist preacher in me would make it clear and plain. Thank you very much for your time.
Absolutely, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Fluka. We appreciate what you've shared. Uh, your ethical model is really interesting. I love the, the way it was broken down. You have integrity and uh, character and uh, several, I think, really important things that could be a whole conversation in itself. So I'd like to invite Jamie and Rabbi Praver and Lisa to join us again. We do have a few minutes for questions. And there's Lisa. Jamie, if you'll come on, and Rabbi Praver, if you'll join us as well. Lisa, I'll turn it over to you for the first question. I want to thank all three of our speakers for yourselves embodying the presence and, as Dr. Fluker put so beautifully, speaking from the center. And raise the question of whether in our deep nature, we are built perhaps to show up for one another in a foundationally, relationally spiritual way. I'm wondering what you think. Is this really who we are? And is suffering the failure to realize this nature and is healing our way through in realizing our nature? I was very moved uh, by both of your presentations. Uh, and I thank you. Um, Jamie and um, Reverend Fluker, uh, Professor. Um, Walter is great. Okay. <laughs> now, um, Anton Boyson, the founder of the CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education, uh, referred to people as having an inner uh, encyclopedic knowledge, an inner spiritual world. And in the uh, Midrash, in the Hebrew uh, uh, rabbinical, reflections, uh, we have this cute little story about a child in utero being taught by an angel all of the secrets of the soul, of the world, of the scriptures, of purpose and meaning of life. And then when they're born, the angel touches right here, and everything is kind of to the recess of the mind. And that's why when we learn something of the spiritual nature, I was very drawn to um, your uh, spiritual experience, Walter, um, how it's like remembering something that you already knew. And therefore, uh, this is a different kind of um, uh, counseling. This is uh, giving a lot of agency to people and saying, you know, the, the answer is within you. And therefore the, uh, the chaplain, the spiritual leader, is just trying to uh, facilitate um, this process of bringing from the subconscious to the to the conscious at the pace in which that the uh, the patient or the parishioner is willing to go because they have to hear it in their own voice uh, then they've got it um, so uh, this idea of remembering really hit me and I like to learn more about Inky and Enola and um, of course, and Jamie, about the um, power, power of the laity to, um, to be there, um, not just the clergy, but all of us can pick up any one of these um, core proficiencies and skills, presence, uh, and be of great use to the community. So I'm just so happy to, uh, to be here with you and, and hear um, what, what you have said as well. Thank you very much. I um, uh, remembering for me has so much to do uh, with returning to oneself, and the basic assumption is that there is already a sense of wholeness within the person or persons, and that it can be discovered. So when I talk about uh, spirituality, I use quest language yeah. for the idea of uh, the unity of consciousness. So as I remember the dismembered parts of myself, my being, hmm. uh, I might very well come up with something new and different from what I thought I was or who I was. And so part of remembering must always entail retelling or reframing this self, yes. which uh, then must have a sense of purpose in living. So I remember, retell, 
and relive my story. Hence, narrative-based uh, ethics, but also narrative-based spirituality. Beautiful. Thus, wow. my last point, uh, it means that people can go to their own traditions. We don't have to search just in one little corner of the house, but we can find in our own backyards precious gems, mm. wonderful truths, and new gifts of the spirit that we can share with others. Jamie, any, any thoughts on that you wanted to share? You know, from some of our current research that we have coming out a new special volume um, in the spring, we conducted a couple different studies and one was led by Dr. Laura Shannon House from Georgia State University. And she found working with older adults about just how much loneliness is having a negative impact on so many people's mental health. And then in another study that we did conducted by collaborators um, that we worked with out of University of North Texas with uh, Dr. Stephen, excuse me, Dr. Joshua Hook that uh, in that particular one, we found that again, people were struggling with that sense of loneliness. So is that something that we need? Is that universal? I, I think so. I mean, and if nothing else, you can turn to the deep theological reflections of Ron Swanson from the latest Parks and Rec episode that even where it aired on the pandemic and it was all about loneliness and mental health. Um, you know, so I, I just shared that humorously, hopefully you thought that was humorous, that uh, I think the research and even what we're seeing in our culture right now really points that that is something universal to each of us. I think one of the things that to me has made this year so incredibly challenging is that we are all experiencing these things together. So normally, you know, when you're going through a difficult time, maybe uh, your husband is not or your best friend girlfriend is not, or, or your pastor or rabbi or imam is not, and you can talk with them. I think part of the challenge of 2020 is that we are universally experiencing um, a sense of trauma, and I use that word sort of hesitantly because obviously it has affected some much more gravely than others, but this has been a very challenging year for everyone. Um, add on top of that, um, the racial discord that uh, Rabbi, our Dr. Fluker mentioned and uh, talked about some and just what we have all experienced there. And then the challenge of, uh, of this election season we have been through. This has been a very difficult year. So I'm curious because I've been so struck this year um, and it relates to what you were just talking about remembering and reflecting uh, one of the things that I have felt very convicted about is that I have to speak clearly to myself. So self-care and self, good self-talk, I think is also very important this year, given the fact that everyone's in, in, in the boat. We're not in the same boat necessarily, but we're all on this troubled sea right now. And, and I just would be curious um, to have you three gentlemen reflect uh, for, for all of us on how important it is to take the steps that you can take um, to care for yourself as well as caring for others. You know, Shannon, hearing you uh, share that example, and I appreciate you um, uh, passing along those words of wisdom that, and to stay with the water metaphor, you know, one of the things that our team, so we actually started our very first response of getting resources out on February 27th, and we've continued to um, continue to respond through this whole time. And so one of the things as a team we've tried to regularly circle back on is how are we also doing? You know, are we also um, following the things that we're encouraging others to do? And one of the metaphors that we often use as a team is that we've thought of this experience in many ways as kind of a bit more like surfing, that, you know, balance is important, but in reality, it's really difficult to have balance, especially when you're helping others. And so as a team, we often think about knowing when to ride the crest and it's okay to have busy seasons. It's okay to be busy and for things to be stressful, but also that we have to know ourselves well enough to when we need to get back down to sh shallow waters or maybe even for a period of time, go all the way back to shore and completely get off the surfboard so that we can go back out and help others again. Right. Right. What, what comes, 
Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I wanted to hear from you, go ahead. Uh, what comes to my mind is uh, Jacob, when he wrestled with the angel, that was the moment that his he was away from his family. It was a realm that was just by himself. And he was really wrestling with something very deep and characterological um, that was flawed and he had to face. And, and uh, Yaakov, Jacob is a uh, crooked, it's related to the word crooked and Yashar, Israel means to, to straighten something out, maybe to reframe something, mm. to understand uh, something deep about oneself and really get it. Um, but it's also a wrestling match and there's some damage and you might be um, limping when the sun rises because this is not for the faint of heart. This is a, uh, first of all, let's name it. This is a very difficult situation that we're all going through. Um, this is something that we will, you know, talk about the way our, you know, um, previous generations spoke about, um, you know, the, um, the crash of 29 and the depression and polio and right. other things. So this is um, our experience here that's very, very real. Um, but uh, at the end, it says that Jacob um, saw God panim el panim, face to face. Um, and there is that um, the other facing the other that we're not alone. Um, and to uh, the great value of the family, the great value of what we hear now of each other. This is so uh, nourishing and, and so, um, you know, pleasurable really to, to have this conversation. And my last little thing on that is that in the Hebrew, it actually says, um, Jacob named the face Peni El, which Pene is your face. And El means God, that he saw mm. the face of God within himself. And then he was able to see the face of God in others. I think that's the challenge. And hopefully we'll meet it some or not. And there's sad stories going on. But I guess that's why we're here to help this story become a good story um, where we can um, rise in the morning and um, come back to our um, families and, and start something great and wonderful in the great society. Mm. Jan, I'm mm. on one, uh, this is Midrash here. So at the end of this story, uh, Jacob leaves with a limp, but he also has a new name, mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. He's the father of a nation. Mm -hmm. So this spirituality is relational. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, when you see the ethical leadership model, those who follow up, the spiritual virtuosities that I name are courage, justice, and compassion. Mm -hmm. That is, this pandemic the racial strife, as it was called, the economic disaster that we're in, are collectivities. They are systemic. And we're called because of our spiritual foundations, because of our quest, to challenge those hierarchies of power that perpetuate crises. And um, Thurman's language is along this line. The person who goes so deep into herself uh, discovers that the very same things that she's trying to rid of herself personally are also writ larger and more systemically in society. Therefore, she cannot get home or realize her personal quest until she also engages, faces, confronts, the powers. Mm. 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 I, I'm struck by um, what you shared, Dr. Pluker, about, uh, about the importance of brokenness and how so often uh, your greatest work. I know uh, Pastor Rick Warren speaks of often your greatest coming out of that place of brokenness. Um, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but the Japanese art form where they actually put uh, cool. into uh, mm. the broken places um, in play to make a more beautiful work of art 
as a result of the brokenness. A very dear friend who commented to me once, never follow a leader who doesn't have a limp. And I think <laughs> quite often it is out of our personal places of brokenness that our greatest leadership will come. So this has been really rich. Lisa, I'm sure you have other thoughts and questions. We're at 110. You got one more question for us? Well, I have noticed that the Q&A is bouncing. We have a lot of questions. Yes. And one theme I see throughout is, you know, how sadly we seem to have lost awareness of who we really are to one mm. another, but that who we can be um, is in fact an emanation of our relationship to what Dr. Fluger called spirit, that we are ambassadors or emissaries of spirit. Um, and as we are loved, we can love each other. Um, that's something I see throughout. Would anyone like to make a final word or two about that theme brought by our collaborators joining us um, through the Q&A box? You know, hearing you share that, Lisa, that I think one of the things that spirituality can help us to be able to do is to enter into more true, authentic relationships with one another. Mm -hmm. That it allows us, kind of like what Shannon was saying there, that you know we can either use our pain as a door or a wall to keep people out, or we can use it as a door to open up and let others in through those wounds to be able to experience us in a much more deeper, authentic, and vulnerable way. I um, think of the burning bush, Moses saying, what's your name? And God says, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't really have a name. This is the real deal here. This is not just uh, one of the many gods. This is uh, the creator, the creator force, the, the power uh, that never began, never ended. This is, this is God here. And uh, if you must uh, say a name, I will be what I will be meaning infinite uh, life, infinite existence, and infinite agency. And that uh, when we uh, tap onto this emanation of God, then um, just as God can become anything, we can too. We can move to a, a place that is perhaps as far as we can imagine. So we have to use our imagination to create uh, the relational, the spiritual place. Um, and a, I'll just end with when Newtown happened, I said, I don't want Newtown to be remembered as the place of the tragedy. I want it to serve as a bridge to a new and kinder world. Mm. I haven't given up on that. I'm still trying. I'd like to, for us to leave with the image of the burning bush accompanied with the desperation, the devastation of Hagar mm. with her little baby thrown out, thrown away, left behind. And she cries out to God in her despair. And there's a spring that emerges and Rabbi, you might help me, but I don't know um, how we reflect on that in contemporary worlds. But the idea that it is in my devastation, in my loneliness, alienation, that I stand in candidacy mm. to see the spring. Mm. My mm -hmm. job, my work in spirituality is to open up the channels and all things that prevent me from seeing it, I must remove. Mm. And I love Hagar for giving us that. I, I embrace her today for giving us that in a world where we must raise children in a desert. That's another conversation, but mm -hmm. we must raise children in deserts. Closing thoughts, Lisa. Well, I want to thank our three wise, generous speakers. I want to thank Ben for his co-piloting and Shannon Royce. I want to thank you for your very close partnership, your leadership, 
and our 2,000 colleagues. Thank you for making yes. this time of connection, community, transformation, and possibility. Absolutely, Lisa. It's been such a joy to, to just walk this journey with you. I thank you for your partnership, for working with the, with the center on this, and just mm -hmm. friendship. As we've walked through this last year together, I think this has been some really rich and informed work. And it is my hope and prayer uh, as we do um, ongoing discussions around the nation that this work is planting seeds around the country. I'm just confident that it's doing that, um, that these kind of conversations are taking place in the cities and communities and regions around the country. So for all of you friends, thank you for joining us. We're so grateful for your presence. We thank our three speakers for the expertise and the experience um, of your journey that you have shared with us today. Um, everyone, watch for that email that's going to show up in your box in the next couple of days. It will provide uh, a video link for today's program for you to share with others, and we do encourage that. Um, and it will also provide the resources that have been shared today. Thank you so much for being with us. God bless you all. Thank be you. safe. I would be in trouble if I didn't remind you as you move into the holiday season, remember, wash your hands, wear a mask, watch your distance. Let's be careful as we await the um, vaccine that is coming very soon. And uh, we will continue to walk through this journey together. God bless Amen. you. Have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you.